Chris, thank you so very much for joining us today. Uh, and perhaps, you know, to start off this interview, you could tell us a little bit more about Schneider Electric as well as what you do with the company. Okay. Uh, in Schneider Electric, actually, you know, we have a, a company with a lot of uh, solution products and so on. Okay. We are like having, we are a $29 billion revenue company. Uh, we usually use 5% of it to go into R&D. We have 128,000 employees around this region. It's quite well mixed because uh, in Western Europe, we got 26%. In Asia Pacific, we got 31% and 14% for the rest of the world, 29% for North America. We actually have split into you know, industry automation and energy management. So as you see, Schneider Electric, we do electric, but at the same time today, we also going into, uh, uh, you know, sustainability, you know, cybersecurity. We have uh, industry automation that does the control system. We call Kuto UPS. So we have a quite, quite broad solution. And today with uh, Aviva being our uh, software partner, and of course, uh, Schneider have a share in Aviva as well. With their solution with us, we actually, uh, form a solution to do what we call echo structure power and process where going we combine the software and the hardware together to form a very uh, uh, so-called uh, wholesome solution for for customer yeah and of course uh, uh, you know Schneider being being uh, now in this market uh, our our you know CEO and our leaders are now looking into ESG in a bigger way. So we have actually a team of uh, so-called sustainability uh, business development team that actually goes around to meet customers to look at the topic on ESG and so on. Yeah. So yeah. Right. Okay. And maybe a little bit uh, that you could tell us about your current role in Schneider and what you do. What does your job normally entail? Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm covering the, currently the APEC uh, so-called uh, oil and gas. VP, but we have changed our name to blend in with the rest. But now we are called energies and chemicals as well. So we are also looking into more energies, chemical. And so today in a lot of oil and gas customer, you can see that they also change their name, like Total, become Total Energies and so on, right? Everyone is actually looking into the new energies. And so Schneider actually ourselves is also looking into this in a big way. So. Uh, myself, actually, with all the different business units that we have, I now also have to read a lot into new energies. <laughs> we keep on learning, <laughs> learn till we are old. And so, yeah, I, I so on all these things is that, you know, uh, I'm usually looking into standard the projects that is happening in this region. You know, what are, what are the changes in company that they are looking towards? their new energies direction and how can we help them. We are moving in on, you know, uh, forming a strategy on like what just now I said, EPMP, Echo Structure Power and Process to bring a more uh, wholesome strategy and solution to customer. And also, you know, uh, looking into, you know, the day-to-day -day sales, marketing, and what else can we do to support uh, end user and EPCs so that their life is better and our life become worse. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, we, we are there to help them and for them to help us as well. Yeah. All right. So I think what you've said uh, before previously about how you are now the vice president of energies and chemicals, you know, and now everyone is making this bit of a name change from oil and gas into energies or, or new energies and chemicals. Why do you think there is, you know, a need for such a change? What do you think has brought it on? I think... I think firstly, when we was into this COVID situation, I think a lot of us was caught un no, no, unaware that this, this virus could have caused such a big impact on our economy and as well as uh, oil and gas customers face a big impact on this as well. I think, you know, when COVID struck us, I think this is one of the key things, but of course it's not only this particular thing, even without COVID, Everyone is looking at COP26, the, you know, the energy that is uh, switching so that, you know, we, we can, can have a bit more decarbonized world so that we can, you know, at least uh, bring ourselves to the 1.5 degrees 
uh, mark that we are looking at uh, 2050, or you know now people look at 2030 plans just before 2050. So I think this is exactly the uh, the way forward that a lot of downstream petrochemical refinery is looking into, and so these are the changes that, of course, the geopolitical situation today have caused a bit of. Uh, this change as well. So these are things that is now, you know, but it's good that I think with COVID now, you know, settling and people are start traveling, I think things might get back to normal. But of course, the shortage of certain uh, raw materials because of the geopolitical situation might cause a, a bit on a supply chain issue. So I think this is something that caused the change in the environment that uh, most refineries, most petrochemicals are looking at. Right. And, you know, al alongside with the geopolitical uh, factors, as well as the COP26 that you've mentioned and the 1.5 degree benchmark, you know, what are some other key concerns uh, that refiners might have when it comes to the current state of the refining and petrochemical industry? Yeah. Actually, I, I've actually went to ask a friend who is actually currently running a, a refinery and petrochemical right. this question as well. Of course, I want, I want to hear uh, their view. Of course, I have my own view. But of course, um, in their, their view to me is that today, you know, oil and gas or petrochemical refinery is a dirty industry that a lot of young young generation do not want to join. So they feel that, you know, uh, People manpower is one of the key issue that they are facing because, uh, you know, uh, as people are aging, they, they see that, you know, these are things that is affecting and how do we train the younger people to come into this industry. I think second is, of course, I think, uh, you know, the plant itself, a lot of plants today are old. So safety and reliability of the plant is one of their concerns. How can they actually make their plant more uh, reliable and, and the safety of the plant. I think what happened is that they want to stretch their plant, you know, more so that they are more profitable. Okay. But of course, it, they must balance between production and safety and reliability. That is something they need to really balance. And of course, profitability, you know, some plant has been built since 1980s. So how are they going to do things like asset performance management to ensure safety is still there. Okay, today all this AI and analytic, you know, all this kind of uh, solution is there. Okay, but between the capex or the opex that they are going to put up on the table to the production and the sales of their product, they need to balance this. I think this is one of the biggest concerns that they see. And also I think uh, health safety, I think is also one of the key things. So, I think the next concern they have is that, you know, most of these refineries are also pressured by the government to say that, you know, how to make your plant more carbon free. So these are coming to them. They are looking at topics like how do I, uh, you know, put on-site solar to offset a bit of all this uh, carbon requirement and so on. So all this offset of uh, carbon is one of the key big key topic, you know, ESG is a big topic itself, you know, uh, it's not just on the e environment, but also the social and governance part that they have to look into. So these are all the things that, you know, the, the refineries and petrochemical are looking at. Yeah. Of course. So decarbonization is a very big factor. It's a very big issue within the industry today. And we see that everyone is, you know, making an effort to get on board with the green transition or the energy transition, so to speak. So I also do understand that, you know, you mentioned earlier about eco-structure uh, and that it's a little bit of a, com of a combination between hard and software. Could you tell us a little more about that? Okay, eco-structure is actually Schneider's term. So a lot of time we go out and say eco-structure, you know, most people will say, what is that? So actually it's a Schneider term where we have this eco-structure where we have put at the connected product all the way to edge control to the analytic software. So as you see, you know, we from today, you know, industry 4.0 or even all these things that people are looking at is how do you 
bring the sensor information all the way to the an analyzer, the, the, the software that, you know, that what we call unified operating center that they can capture all this information. Because today, because of like what we said earlier on COP26, on COVID, a lot of plant is trying to see, can they have a plant that is unmanned, you know, have lesser operators running around, you know, than to, to you know, catch the virus or something happen. But what they want is intelligence coming back to you. So with that, actually, EcoStructure is something where we connect the connected product, whether is it the instrument, the IEDs from the electrical, what does this information from the ground that brings to the edge control, the historian, and from the historian, uh, how do you, you know, uh, siphon the data to form a rich data for you to run your plan. So Schneider, actually, this echo structure, we have all this software from, from you know, Prism, we have uh, Romeo that do advanced process control for petrochemical, we have Spiral that, that study, you know, what is the crude oil movement and the quality of the crude oil coming in, APM like Prism to, uh, to look at the rotating equipment, health of the equipment. So these are the intelligence to tie up and the information comes from a sensor, a, a connected product. And so with the whole thing is what we call eco-structure. Yeah. Right. So I understand that it's a bit more of an asset <coughs> management uh, software or system, so to speak. So where's the eco part of this? <laughs> eco part actually to be frank is just echo structure, that's, that's all we, we call it. But on the echo part of it, actually, you, you give you know you give me a tough question because uh, when, when our leader call it eco structure, I do not know whether the eco part of it was you know included in the eco part. But actually the eco part of it, I think today with the sustainability business development group, we have a group that actually we have now have a software called microgrid advisor. Okay, we tie up the solar, wind, hydrogen, anything that called eco-green solution. And how do you pull in the energy to, to understand that, you know, in which part of the day that is more cost effective to run by solar or by wind so that it's more eco for the plant to run energy in that sense. So on this eco part, I think the other part on eco is that, you know, today with our, our, products or our solution, like from our control system, we have re redesigned our thing so that we go around the, you know, the, the circular economy, the eco part of it. Because today, you look at it, it's like Schneider is very into this uh, sustainability. Mm. So we have actually also look at, I think 1000 over of our supplier to, to go on this journey with us so that we can reach our, you know, SBTI target. Because Schneider being eco, okay, I think we have set our SPTI target for 2030 and 2050. So with that is not, you know, we have to look at our scope one and scope two as well. <laughs> so we have to also look at our supplier to meet that particular scope that we can contribute to our sustainability goal. Yeah. So this eco part is there. Uh, I hope this is uh, what we have, but actually there's more to it because today, is you know if this uh, if, uh sustainability solution is still everyone's topic to learn and to improve yeah absolutely i think that when it comes to sustainability uh you know companies are still learning from one another yeah. and you know this this brings me to my next question actually are there any case studies or you know any success stories or any pilot tests that you might be able to share with us regarding you know the implementation of eco structure Okay, actually, in Schneider now, we are testing out the solution, what we call CO2 GHG advisor. So it's a carbon emission advisor. Okay, this is a new software that we are testing out in a refinery in Egypt. I cannot mention the name of the thing, okay? It's something that we are testing out. And, you know, of course, in this session, anyone that is hearing this and they want to do a test with Schneider on their plant, please contact me. It's a way of marketing now. <laughs> but I think it's a good thing that, you know, on this sustainability uh, 
pathway, I think is or route that or, or you know, or, or plan that everyone have. I think everyone is learning, like what you say. Because today, whether you go by SBTI target, there's so many standards that we still do not know which standard to move in. But I think SBTI is something that a lot of people use. So I, I believe that, you know, if let's say uh, the customer is willing to look at it, come to me and or come to Schneider, we can look at how we can implement this GHG emission advisor together with them. But of course, ecostructure is like what you say, big topic, right? So a lot of plant, they already have their instrument, their sensor, their valves and so on. But how do you implement it? Okay, is something more like, you know, uh, if they have a already certain existing system and they need us to come and do this support, we can do that. But of course, in, in, in this example that we have, actually we got quite a lot of plant that is uh, using our, our control system, our electrical system. So what we do is that, you know, this is where we show them our value of ecostructure. Right. Okay, so let's move on currently. And I think all in all, the downstream oil and gas industry has to navigate the post-pandemic era, you know, after two whole years of COVID. And uh, in your opinion, what exactly should operators prioritize in order to survive and thrive? <laughs> this topic, again, I've asked my friend. You right. Know. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, the key thing is that, of course, uh, I think one of the key things that they are saying is that, okay, uh, whatever that they are doing, they need to be profitable. I think one of the key things when Russia and Ukraine situation uh, have caused them big issue on, you know, the crude oil going up too high. They are now like looking at, you know, hunting for naf cheap nafta that they can be more profitable, more, uh, you know, uh, more uh, cost effective in doing their production. And I think the lockdown in China is another one that mm. caused them to suffer a bit because the supply chain of, you know, all these chemicals that produce into plastic or all these things is now not fully used. So this is what they are saying that, you know, they, they have to balance between their production, the plant maintenance, and also, you know, the demand. So on this, I think, I think this is where they are navigating into. But the, the fact is that will petrochemical totally be obsolete, you know, like COP26 is saying, oh, please don't do any more fossil fuel kind of solution. But the fact is that <laughs> all these things will be still there and this will be still going on. So how do we actually uh, look at uh, this market actually and how do we help them to, you know, navigate so that they can be more profitable? I think this is something that, you know, they are looking at and they are striving towards. So I think... Uh, hope the situation get better and then the downstream market can be uh, more profitable. But of course, I think the key thing is that they are looking at how to source for the lowest price NAFTA so that they can crack, produce more effective uh, uh, chemicals. Yeah. So when it comes to things like geopolitical events or when it comes to, well, the fact that we're still recovering from the pandemic, where do you think the industry is headed in the future? I think today the industry is, like I said earlier, this industry on refinery and petrochemical will not be totally obsolete. You know, mm. There will be still need for this. That's why if you look at the world market in terms of uh, oil and gas, the production of oil and gas is never like, you know, I will minus one million pro barrels of oil. Now it's more like, how much do you increase that is more meet the market demand? So I think for refinery is still there. I think you look at uh, refinery today in India and Indonesia, okay, they are all looking at how do they, uh, you know, redesign their, their refinery to be more, uh, you know, carbon free, emission free, and so on. So. So I, I believe this market will be still there. And the uh, only thing is that uh, how do they look at uh, topics like reliability, safety, carbon neutrality, 
and so on. And I think cybersecurity is also one key topic that they are looking into as well. So the future petrochemical and chemical, okay, I think it's more like how do you move towards uh, more ESG compliance uh, plan, okay? Right. To do that, I think, especially refinery and petrochemical, they might be looking at blue hydrogen. So depending on the situation, I think, you know, blue hydrogen means they have to capture the carbon and produce the hydrogen. Of course, the hydrogen have a big use, the carbon have a big use, you know, to balance their production of just chemical, they might be able to produce hydrogen to become an energy supplier to the market using hydrogen to the market. So these are things that is still there. Uh, I believe everyone is thinking of this topic. I think in uh, this Thursday, I'm, I'm having a session to talk about this topic on blue and green hydrogen. So of course, this topic of blue, green hydrogen is still, especially green hydrogen is still new, right? It's like, uh, people is talking about how do you liquefy hydrogen and transport hydrogen. I think these are topics that even myself, I, I think a lot of us can't, can't answer until there's a new technology on steel that can do storage on <laughs> liquefied hydrogen. So, so, but overall, I think that petrochemical and chemical plant, okay, a refinery are looking at this topic on uh, reliability, uh, how you digitize the plant more, mm. how you make the plant more uh, carbon net zero free kind of thing. Yeah, so these are the future topic that a lot of uh, refinery petrochemical are looking at. Yeah. Right. So we know that, as you have said, you know, sustainability is, is really increasingly becoming a corporate CSR and ESG concern, you know, which we are looking at. And I think this ties back a little bit to what you mentioned earlier about the, the rebranding, so to speak, of oil and gas into new energies and chemicals. Um, we do see some concern that's been raised uh, about how with this rise of sustainable uh, fuels and renewables, it's looking less and less like the oil and gas industry. What are your opinions on this? Yeah, I think this is where you can see People like, you know, Petronas, uh, Total, like I say, they change to Total Energies and a lot of people is looking into all these topics. BP is looking at things into carbon capture, storage solution. Reliance is, you know, looking big time into solar and battery energy storage system. So a lot of all these oil and gas company is moving into some of this uh, solution one way or the other. I think some is because of their plant need that they need to decarbonize. Uh, some, you know, country have already agreed on COP26 that they will try to meet a certain criteria. So I believe the country will most probably pressure the heavy industry like, you know, refinery, petrochemical into what are you doing to decarbonize. So all these topics that all these uh, company is looking at, they need to look at this topic in a bigger way. Uh, but how they go and do it, because this topic on ESG, like I say, is so big that, you know, it's not just the environment part of it, but how about the social part of it? Mm. You know, how are they going to address the sustainability development goals, you know, uh, no hunger, better use of water and so on. So all these things, they, they are, as a corporate, they need to look at it in terms of what are they doing to make sure, you know, there's more people that don't have education and so on, best use of water. So these are things that they are now looking into because I think when some of these plan, they want to do expansion or thing, they also go to a bank to look for, for funding. But at the same time, some of this bank is now looking at ESG, you know, investing kind of uh, what have you done for this, particular part of it before they lend money to them. So I would say that some of these plants are looking at this topic in, in a bigger way. Right. And so would you say that increasingly the oil and gas industry is slowly becoming uh, or transforming into a wholly different industry? They will have a mix of uh, uh, the, the conventional and the mix of uh, energy transition. So, so I know that some companies are 
looking into you know investing especially i think you know singapore is that you know we are looking at the 60000 mm -hmm. ev charging across the whole singapore there's some of this oil and gas company that is going to bid for this ev charging so that you know today instead of they now sell uh, lng chemical or lng chemicals the conventional way they now looking into solar wind and you know ev charging battery energy storage system so a lot of them are moving into this and even you know today uh, some some end user are looking at hydrogen how do they move mm -hmm. forward with hydrogen so all these renewables things are, are changing in a big way i think one of the key thing is that i was you know like what you say what what do i do every day right every day i go into youtube i go into internet read a lot of all this topic about electrify electrifying the offshore field <laughs> And all these things about, you know, how do you do, how, how do you do energy transition in a better way? And today with the, you know, Singapore coming out with the ISO 14064, okay, uh, we need to understand how they verify before we can validate, right? So, mm -hmm. so they will verify, you know, people like, you know, Tufsuit and so on will verify, but people like us must know uh, how do they verify and what do they look for so that we can validate it. So, so this is certain things that we need to learn and understand further so that we can help our oil and gas customer, the, the EPCs and so on to meet this transition for them as well. Right. I think it's very admirable that you, know, you make such an effort to keep learning and keep growing your skills as well. Um, as you've said, you know, we look at electrification, the energy transition. These are also overarching themes at this year's Asian Downstream Summit, which you'll be a part of. So perhaps you could tell us, you know, what can we look forward to uh, to see from Schneider Electric at this year's conference and event? I believe in, in Schneider Electric, I think my colleague is talking about this topic. I think Eric Corning is having a paper that is going to talk on this topic on decarbonizing and how Schneider can support them to do this. Um, there is, uh, I think, this panelist session where you know they are also looking at circular economy and so on. So, uh, you know, re reach out to my colleague Eric Corning here at that session. I think they can understand more on uh, what Schneider is doing in this space, and also I think. My another colleague who is going to fly in from uh, Middle East, Irfan, you know, he also in one of the panelists to talk about all this circular economy and so on. And, and even my boss, Astrid, will be coming for the session as well to, to talk about this topic on sustainability and so on.